to the military industrial complex. Oh yeah. Um, oh wow. Wow. <laughs> well, is that, good. is that why the uh, Chinese dragged their anchor and uh, cut Finland off? <laughs> I spoke to the Chinese guys, and they were actually quite collaborative. Oh, I, yeah. I was on mainland China, and I asked them some direct questions, and they gave me brutally direct answers. Good. I suspected they were even laughing at me, but oh well. <laughs> oh yeah. But I, I heard that the, a big Chinese ship uh, dragged its anchor and pulled up an electric line that went to uh, yep. Finland. Yep, yep. It, it's, so, it's, it's, so uh, this is our fifth generation warfare. It's multi-dimensional. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is the nastiest warfare to date. Yeah. So they mean it. They absolutely mean it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm I'm just gonna do the intro here. Uh, here so sorry guys, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, well, I already have it live. <laughs> uh, greetings in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator. And we are here today to gather, uh, talk about peak oil and uh, transition. And we have Simon Michaud, uh, Ivor Laughing, Leon Mead, Doom Wurborn. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, thorium and natural gas and uh, uh, other related things. And, and Simon, uh, go, go ahead, what you were, uh, right. continue what you were saying. <laughs> okay, so in my travels recently, I've been speaking to a whole lot of uh, fairly senior people and uh i've been they've all been uh, representing the problems for years now as all we all have everyone on this call has been presenting problems to people uh but for reasons unknown um i happen to be at the right place at the right time where when i'm presenting them to people uh people who are in positions of, you know who advise people in, in positions of power and they make decisions themselves like government ministers they're asking me questions they're not throwing me out of the building. I'm not being tarred and feathered and thrown in the street. Uh, and they're That's quite good. polite to me, and they're actually quite collaborative. That's uh, excellent. And their questions have told me exactly what needs to happen, where it needs to happen, and who needs to do it, and who's not going to do it. So, uh, yeah, this is the environment we're in. Good. So, so what's what's the rundown like? What what needs to happen and do, do right. you have a yeah um, it's just like a, a i don't know if this is just um how i'm describing it whether you know whether i happen to come across the magic solution as, as such it's just how i've described it but everyone i've spoken to is helpless every politician every decision maker i've, I've met they're all part of this massive system and that system has momentum and they cannot um, problem solve around it. But like, any action that they might take to change things uh, or, or actually put some genuine solutions on the ground has the actual outcome of destroying their careers. And that's um, at all levels of the system. Mm -hmm. You think of it, you, 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 let's say you're, you're an executive mm -hmm. on the executive board of, say, a large corporation and you present to them the concept of peak oil. What do they do? Yep. You know, uh, oh, and then you point out, says, well, the nature of money is actually one of the serious problems. We can't use money anymore. We can't use energy anymore. We, uh, uh, one of the implications is the just-in-time supply grid across the planet is about to become unreliable, a subject to monkey business and a geopolitical front. And then, then the everyone else around the table says, okay, you might be correct, but we're going to throw you out of the room now. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> that's, the, that's the situation they find themselves in. What they're hoping is everyone around the table, collectively, are all coming to the same conclusions at the same time, which is sort mm. of what's happening now. If, if these ideas are actually taking root and they're spreading like wildfire, and so now what we are all hoping is instead of actually sort of having a tense discussion about like should we throw them out of the room or not, it's okay. These are the challenges we're facing. We just don't know what to do. And that's kind of where most of the people I'm talking to now are at. They, they just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they don't. And, and so when I sort of say, like, it's become apparent what needs to happen is I can't rely on any of those people. Right. And so the entire Western world is so enamored with the current system that uh, 
so, so, so the, the path going forward, for example, is um, I have to two fronts. One is that, uh, everyone at all levels of our society in all directions in all sectors get our arms around the the network of problems we've got in front of us, the challenges. We don't have to agree, but become educators so we can at least debate and be aware of what has to happen, right? And the second thing that has to happen is there are solution vectors. Some of them are social, some of the most important ones are social, right? But we've got to take these ideas and turn them into outcomes. And so what we now need is a whole lot of groups popping up all over the world, you know, like, like what Dune is actually running in northern um, New South Wales could be one of those groups where you have a group of people who come together for a reason to innovate or, or to develop a series of ideas. Right? And, 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 uh, uh, and those are, and they're popping up all over the world. There's lots of concept innovation hubs popping up all over, and everyone's got a paradigm they're working towards. So then what has to happen is those innovation hubs then have to then collaborate with each other and tell each other what they've learned. Some will be about food production. Some will be about manufacture. Some will be about uh, medicine. Some will be about education. Uh, some of them will be about like, like social systems, like how, how do we live? What's our relationship with the environment? Um, what I'm actually going for now is a new energy slash technology slash commodity sourcing system based on what I've seen so far. And these ideas are seriously threatening to the people around me. Uh, not, not the people around me, sorry, so, but, but the broad brush interest groups. And I know they're watching me. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I still say that, for example, the UN's just released a new report uh, on, on um, a life cycle assessment of renewable technology. And that they're, they're starting to say things out loud that, uh, that are real. Um, these guys will not acknowledge that my work exists, but I know they're all watching my work very carefully and I'm still getting high level support from somewhere. Mm -hmm. right? So, so it, it's like I'm operating outside of the system, if you will. And um, while I'm allowed to do this for whatever reason, I'm going to be as effective as I can. And I've, I've, uh, um, that, that's why I'm sort of, you know, trying to be as productive as I can, because this window may not, you know, it, it may not always be this way. So, um, yeah, anyway, so so I'm actually going to go outside the Western world, form an innovation hub, found a small city, and oh, wow. put a, uh, a whole series of unorthodox ideas together. Mm -hmm. My work will now merge with the Venus Project mm -hmm. in Florida, USA, and their work's going to evolve and my work's going to evolve, and together we'll develop something new. And I'm then going to go into a funding drive getting um, where I'm we'll, we'll soon, the Venus project can take donations now through their website, but we're about to launch properly. Uh, in fact, I actually have a hard stop at five o'clock, which is in 45 minutes. And oh. The reason I have that the reason I have that is because I've got a workshop with the Venus project people to actually develop what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So this is, this yeah. is real. Yeah. So yeah. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps I should stand down now and leave you hand you the reins. Oh, so, Wait, five minutes? I thought it would no, be 50 minutes. 45 Four, minutes. 45 minutes. Okay, 45 minutes. Yeah, I actually had a question from uh, Interim Humanity. Is the Venus Project doing something new, and is Michaud going there for good? So, yes, so that, they are doing something um, um, new. We are mm -hmm. actually developing a new concept, and that concept, that concept is... Um, an evolution of the Venus project powered by an unconventional energy source operating to new resources management paradigm is now proposed. The plan will have elements of circular economy, steady state economy, permaculture, regenerative agriculture, degrowth, and the Venus project. And they're all going to merge into line with my work and the work of uh, Harold Sturdrop. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, we're taking bits from everywhere and we're now putting something new on the ground. And I can show you some of those things today if we've got time. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, so uh, just to make it clear, are you moving to Florida then? No, 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 no. no. So oh, okay. I'm in, I'm in Helsinki. Uh -huh. uh, what, uh, what we actually want to see happen is since Florida is where the Venus Project is now, and that's going to be like the central hub. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build what, what I call a gateway city. Okay. Uh, 
there's several targets around the world. There's five or six of them. There is one mm -hmm. preferred site. They're all outside the Western world. Okay. And um, when we actually sort of, the, the first part is uh, we're going to ask for donations to get us going. Mm -hmm. uh, more, more donations sort of come in and then, then I can actually leave my job and actually sort of go and uh, raise capital. I need to raise between three and five billion US dollars to build this city. That's wow. what it takes to build something like this. That mm -hmm. is actually not unreasonable, right? But we just need mm -hmm. to actually have the money for flights and accommodation for uh, me and two other people to get together. There's a group of 20 people around us. We're scattered all over the world. Once we get to the point where we are funded, we can start looking at scoping studies. People from all over the world will congregate together and we'll go through the feasibility shoot of scoping study, pre-fees, feasibility, and so on, to the point where construction and tender. And that's actually my professional uh, world coming in. Once we mm -hmm. actually sort of get to the point where something's going to happen, what we believe will happen is we will be swamped by people who are saying, right, here's my land. I'm independently wealthy. Uh, here's some money. And we want you to set up another city in this one. So we'll have like a network of cities that will evolve. And it will all mm -hmm. be managed, as in not, not managed, but, but organized, if you will, around the mm -hmm. Florida site. So the Florida okay. site in its current form needs to evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to meet, you know, more resources need to be put into it. More people need to be there. Um, we, we want to build a conference center, uh, uh, an archive for your so There's a whole lot of stuff that we're looking at. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to stay in Helsinki for now uh, mm -hmm. in Finland, uh, but then things will probably move. And when they move, uh, I'll be traveling all over the world but when we've actually got a site to go to um, and probably start with, say, 50 to 100 people, and we'll start out like a, a mining operation as mm -hmm. we build the city, if there's, there's a place to move to, my wife and I will move there. And at this mm -hmm. stage, I go to South America. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. South mm -hmm. America. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I had a related question. Uh, where is the preferred location for Porta Arantas? Okay, that's actually a site in Peru. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're negotiating a lease with the landowners, but that mm -hmm. lease is actually not there yet, so we can't. I shouldn't have really let that name out. It oh, the, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I've already done it. Uh, I didn't realize okay. when I presented it to Chris Martinson, but, but it's... it's um. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're negotiating the lease and the landowners have to be sort of happy and involved and partners and NDAs are signed, MOUs are signed, all that sort of stuff, but it, it ain't over till we've got that lease. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, preliminary designs are on the floor now uh, and we're actually in, uh, in a little bit, I'll be talking to the Venus Project people directly and we're going to start developing the media package where we can actually talk about how we're going to do this and release it there's lots of ideas around and lots of people have great ideas we've got to include them all and sort of you know have a discussion amongst us about you know what's, what's the best combination and uh, it can't all be done by one person right so we've got to sort of assign tasks that's mm -hmm. that's all in the in pro so what i'm just saying is that the venus project's been talking for a long time about doing stuff when are going to have a, uh, a serious red hot go to actually put some results on the ground and mm. that will be in the form of a city of 10,000 people built in stages. And at its heart, is what, are, what uh, there'll be a research institute with 2,000 people, scientists, engineers, technicians, and support staff. And those research, that research group will be broken up about 40 to 50 research groups. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you're in Brazil at the moment, mate. Um, yeah, well, this is South America, yeah, but here's Peru. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're um, going to land on a place and a patch of land that there's not developed at the moment, and we're going to mm -hmm. do it in a way where we're not in competition with resources of any kind with, for, with the locals. And okay. we want to open source some ideas to help the locals to make their society better. <clears throat> and doing so, the locals will see us as a net positive. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's a good strategy. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I would think that here where the rainfall is is, is better <laughs> would be good. Uh, but I don't know if, if you guys are planning on, because I know some parts of Peru is very dry. We're in the desert. 
We're in the dry. You're in the desert. Oh, okay. In the okay, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. but that, that, that mm -hmm. while no one else wants to touch that with a barge pole, that's actually a um, solution. Right. Mm -hmm. For example, what we do is we land a thorium reactor in mm -hmm. the desert. We take seawater from the coast. We're yeah. on around the coast, take seawater, mm -hmm. generate, turn it into steam. The heat from the reactor turns it into steam, use that steam to generate electricity. That then steam then cools and condenses, and then we'll put it in a reservoir. And as it cools, we can then irrigate that area and green the desert. And that's our fresh water and that's our drinking water. The ah, brine yeah. salt, it gets better. <laughs> the brine salt um, will have it irrigating downhill towards the coast. And on the way, we will strip all metal elements out of the sea salt. When we get to the mm -hmm. bottom, we will be taking the sodium, a salt of sodium um, iodine, take out the sodium, which we will make batteries out of. Ah. Right. Mm -hmm. And the iodine that's left, we will then take it back to the city to help treat the black water circuit, you know, the, the sewerage. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. We're, we're, is, this is going to be a desert technology city. Mm -hmm. And water is very, very scarce. We have to treat it as such. So the sewerage mm -hmm. uh, then has to be treated in a way where we can use it in agriculture, uh, but we mm -hmm. can also use it safely. So we've got to actually take the bacteria load out of the sewerage. And iodine is actually one of the chemicals that is actually uh, useful for that. Mm -hmm. And so what's left, but there's a tiny, tiny bit of residue left. We put that on a ship. We take it far out to sea where the strips, and we return it to the sea in a way where it can disperse over a wide range very quickly right so mm. the fact that it's desert is actually not something that stops me at all and mm -hmm. this is the, using the principles of the circular economy okay yeah mm -hmm. w waste products are actually feedstock for something else it's, it's like industrial systems in a cluster and everything works like an organic farm where the outputs mm -hmm. of one operation are an input to another the there, I'm not sure what the soil there is, um, but I, I do know like that there are obviously things you can grow in the desert, and you yep. could grow a permaculture fruit forest in the desert yep. uh, with uh, like pomegranates and cactus pears and mesquite and yep. wattle. Yeah. So there's there's no water there. Like there's about sixty millimeters a year. So mm -hmm. there's bugger all water. Uh, yep. GTK at the moment, the geological server that I work for, one of their jobs is actually rehabilitating land that's been sterilized uh, from mm -hmm. um, industrial agriculture. And part of that is getting the mineral balance right and then getting the organic uh, humus level to a more acceptable level. So that's what we're doing. If we've got a regular water source, we're going to green the desert. Yes, we want to grow food. Yes, we're looking at permaculture. Yes, we're looking at things like hydrogeology. I'm going to get the Peruvian Geological Survey and the G and, and GTK to map the shit out of this area. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we want to know what's above the ground, below the ground, out to sea. We want to know it all. You know, what's the water table doing? What happens every twenty years with these flash floods that, that happen in the region? You know, what happens there? Oh, yeah. With those flash floods, I know very important is to uh, set up swales before the flash floods yep. because those are a very important source of water in the region and you want to contain as much of that water without it uh running off so part of, the, part of the operation is to terraform the site i'm going to mm -hmm. go all mining engineer and just do a shitload of drill and blast to to level there's there's lots of it's a very hilly terrain knock the tops mm -hmm. off hills and fill valleys once we understand the watershed and where water's going to terraform the state into a series of, of terraces and steps, but also have places where water can actually go and ca we can catch lots of water. Yes, swales are part of it, but we're also going to terraform whole valleys. Mm. And this is actually mm. what happens in an open mine, open cut mine, when we dig a open pit. We drill and blast a, a lot of rock. Yeah, Ivor, talk to me. Yeah. Uh, you, you got on mute, Ivor. Good. Yeah, okay. I just talked to... um. A guy by the name of Daniel Sandwise, and he's at the University of Maine uh, Climate Change Institute, and he's also an archaeologist and uh, anthropologist, and he has been working with the uh, people in that whole area uh, of Peru, which is the, um, uh, you know, that arid coast of Peru, which was the Nazca culture, and yep. he has a very detailed uh, 
study of how uh, El Ninos have affected that area. And, yeah. you know, the El Ninos way back, back to, uh, you know, two, you know, 4,000 years ago, the El Ninos have periodically affected that area. And they had a very complicated uh, system of uh, uh, irrigation and stuff in that area coming up from the, uh, the Andes Mountains. So yeah, if you so talk to him, he is really an interesting character. We, we are actually in contact with the people in the area who are doing that. In fact, I've had mm -hmm. to move my city more than once because mm -hmm. we found that that's actually some archaeological um, ruins happen to be right where I wanted to put my um, uh, metal smelters. I said, all right, all right, we'll move it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dune. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to unmute, Dune. You're muted. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Simon, you might have heard of Jeff Lawton, who's a yep. permaculture king. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's he's been doing greening of the desert in Jordan. Yep. Um, so a lot of the work that he would have done there would probably probably be applicable in in yes. such an area. Yeah. So there's, there's about twenty people around me, and we are talking to people with green deserts, and we found the most useful are the Chinese because they stole them from everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and so they, it's the, they're like they've done a literature search and what works. <laughs> but yes, Jeff Lawton's name has come up. So, yeah. but we are greening the desert, but it's actually part of a larger system, right? So, yes, we've got to reinvent agriculture where we're not allowed to use petrochemical fertilizers or GMOs. Um, yes, we're going to manage you know, the hydrogeology both real time but also across decades. We are trying to create a situation where everything that we need will eventually come um, from the sea in a way where we're not vulnerable to local weather patterns. If we can do that uh, over time, like it'll take time to do, you, you know, it'll take, you know, 10, 20 years, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, these things will happen in stages. The energy stuff will happen pretty quick because a lot of it's already done. Right. Like the molten salt reactors. That's and then one of them. Turns out yeah. there's two. Yeah, but yes, okay. I've got a, if we get around to it, I've got a list of who's actually developing thorium uh, technology at the moment. But that's actually an easy solution if I can actually get one on the land. That's going mm -hmm. to be the, uh, the, the second one is actually about burning, burning or oxidizing iron powder uh, for heat. Oh, okay. And so, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, anyway, so, so if, if we, we are talking to like a, a whole group of people uh, um, on three basic fronts. There's the industrial stuff, there's the new relationship with the environment front, and there's a new social contract front. And because of what's involved, the energy and in, 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 uh, stuff is relatively easy in comparison uh, because a lot of it's already done. We just need to assemble the bits together, uh, whereas the um, environmental biosystems agriculture front, that'll take years to do because we've got to prepare the land. We've got to prepare the land first. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so that has to... Um, uh, come together um, uh, second and the social contracts of everyone who's actually done this before has failed so we've got a game theory lab to set up to actually examine why that is mm -hmm. and have a discussion with the relevant people over a period of time so we can actually sort of morph into a society and we'll start out as a private company like a mine where we're, everyone's mm -hmm. there with a job to do they get paid we're going to uh, we're going to trial a few uh, a new concept of money uh, so instead of actually going straight to the moneyless society, we'll we'll do it in stages where we um, um, use a local through. currency. So no, oh, we'll, no. We'll accept all of it. All right. So so we're going to change the nature of money and ch change the rules of everything. Right. So so if we actually uh, when you need money for see five hundred years ago, what do we need money for? And so most people, for example, did. Um, got what they needed from the land themselves and money was used only every now and then for some purchases but now we need money for everything so if we can actually get to the point where we move away from that and if we say well the people who are living in the city right if we're going to set this up as a, as a hub and we're going to nowhere we'll do a thing where we build and construct all the land all the buildings all the systems and that's owned by the same entity people who come to work there they get assigned a house here's a house uh, things like electricity, water, sewerage, education, uh, medical services, all that stuff is free, as in it's complementary of actually being there. Oh, food too. We're going to be importing food until we can actually um, 
uh, uh, get, start to grow our own. And eventually, actually, oh, and when we actually do start growing our own stuff, we want to be able to uh, grow hemp and bamboo as well as mm. food. I'm going to set up a hemp cycle and we'll start making stuff out of hemp. And where we're going is actually able to do that. Whereas in terms of legislation in the Western world, that's, that, that gets rough. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so back to money. So if we get to the point where um, we are managing our resources with uh, some kind of crypto slash blockchain technology, where we can manage how many people we've got in the city, what are their actual needs, what have we got to work with? I mean, you know, in d dynamic equilibrium context, we manage all that so we never actually get a shortage. And so we have this system that is transparent and orderable by everyone what happens and what goes where and then what happens next mm -hmm. right and so then we go to the point well this is what we're going to do and so that is actually the first tier in a two-tier system everything we need is managed the second tier is a conventional wage we need a way of actually sort of people can come there and and and, and work and live but not compromise their career they can interact with the rest of the world and they don't have to risk anything by joining Right, so they'll mm. get like a, a, a second tier as a wage, and it, it, that'll be in whatever currency they want. We'll be accepting cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. If you want to get paid in Bitcoin, we'll do it. Um, oh, yeah, it's also going to be cool where it's actually possible for us to be extracting gold from the local countryside in these really, really small, high grade deposits. So I want to get in the position where I can pay my staff in gold bullion if they want. <laughs> oh, wow, that would be serious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so what, whatever people want, and it's going to be whatever currency that we're going to get hold of. Is it the US dollar still? Is it um, is it the Puerto Rican? Uh, uh, is it the Peruvian currency? Um, is, is it, you know, whatever. whatever what, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so, so people can come. I can employ someone. They can move there. They can work there. They can bring their families. Eventually, we want a you know, family-friendly environment where... They can actually um, store wealth. They're not they're not compromising anything themselves, and they can interact with the rest of the world anytime they want, just like anyone else. But we're now changing the nature of what money is needed for. They don't need that money to live in the city, because everything mm -hmm. else is provided, from transport all the way up to medical services. And so we, we'll start out as a company, but somewhere along the way, probably when children hit the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we start needing daycare centers and you know, you know, you know, postnatal uh, postnatal care and all that. Uh, that's when we're going to start thinking about, well, now we need to morph into a democratically run city. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. And that's still, well, there's ideas on the ground, but we're still sort of you know, playing with that. So, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, could you tell us about uh, your trip to Copenhagen, about the Thorium? Right. Plant? I can do that. Mm-hmm. So let me let me yeah, you share. Wanted to share. Okay, go ahead. So I'm going to sh what I'm sharing here is get back to Jitsi. Start screen sharing window. Here we are. I presented this to the British Embassy. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I see it. See, it? I presented it to the British Embassy GTK conference that happened a few days ago, and I call it Black Swans, White Swans, and the Purple Transition. I'm going to try and put it into presentation mode and tell me if you can actually see it. Can you still see it? Right now I do. Okay, yeah, I see the seconds. It says okay. summary. So okay. I'm going to rocket through this real quick. Um, okay. The presentation has been given to you. You can have it and send yep. it off to anyone who wants it. So yeah, it's in the link is in the comments below. Yep. Um, mapping the green transition, uh, calculations around the four buffer sizes, which is the real controversy at the moment, quantity of metals needed, Okay, you've seen all that. Make batteries out of something other than lithium-ion chemistry. It's not rocket science, hey. <laughs> it's really not. Mm -hmm. uh, iron phosphate. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, so uh, LFP is actually part of my calculations at the moment. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the commodities industry has been misunderstood. So I present liquid fuel fission, and this is the Copenhagen study, and then ammonia-fueled ICE. I coined the term the purple transition, because the green transition's dead. Well, it's not mm -hmm. dead, but it, it's probably not going to go the way they think, and so mm -hmm. we're probably going to do other things instead. And so let me just... You've, see, you've seen all this in other podcasts, so I won't actually sort of... So they're the four mm -hmm. buffers. Yeah. And and this is the metals needed. That's not going to work, etc., etc. All right. Mm -hmm. 
make batteries out of something else. So this mm -hmm. is the theoretical potential of each battery chemistry. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, you've got lithium in the bottom left-hand corner, which means mm -hmm. you... The, and then you go all the way up. The, the, the top right is the best. And so you've got sodium, and then you've got fluoride. You know, the fluoride in your toothpaste turns out to be <clears throat> a very um, efficient system. Then you've got mm -hmm. uh, things like zinc, zinc and sodium, like metal air batteries. So all mm -hmm. of these things can be found in our waste. So this is actually a circular economy action. Um, not rocket science. Um, right, so that brings us to thorium. Now, um, I think you've already seen this section already. This is actually a report from Oakland Ridge um, Nuclear Laboratory, 1972, that said this works. Mm -hmm. uh, so the system, just quickly, um, you have thorium in a salt form, that's fuel. You put it in the reactor and you bombard it with neutrons from, from a nuclear source uh, or a proton lamp. And mm -hmm. some of that thorium then is then excited to a different isotope state. Uh, it goes through several stages and it gets to uranium-233, then heats mm -hmm. up, uh, the salt liquefies, and it starts moving around the reactor in a circuit. Once it's, um, once it's got that, it doesn't need the nuclear source anymore. And so it's generating heat. And so that heat is then transferred to another circuit, another, uh, um, another salt uh, information. Uh, heat is transferred. That heat is then used to turn water into steam, turn a turbine, and generate electricity. Now, there's mm -hmm. two fail safes. One is the thorium reaction. Um, if it gets to a, a certain temperature, it starts to cascade and collapse, right? So it can't melt down, but it can collapse as it just stops. And the other one is if we hit this freeze plug, uh, it's got this freeze plug, and if it gets too hot, that can melt, and the fuel can drain out of the reactor and put into dump tanks and be managed that way. So there's not one, but two fail safes. So with this technology, we can't really have a Fukushima or a Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. So here is the Oakland Ridge, uh, Oak Ridge Molten Salt Reactor, uh, 1969, seven, 6,000 hours of power generation without a problem. It started with uranium salt, then it looked at thorium salt. This is the uh -huh. Chinese system. Now, when I was in China, I was actually told by um, a Chinese official that this is real. And it's now mm -hmm. commercially selling power as of 2022. Mm -hmm. And and you don't see this in anywhere in the Western media, but that's actually a Japanese um, uh, a newspaper that actually sort of put it out. Mm -hmm. So this is the actual cycle of the two, like the footprint, to show that they are different. So we're going to generate 10,000 gigawatt hours of electrical power over one year. To mm -hmm. do that, mine 123 million tonnes of uranium ore and turn it into 32.9 tonnes of uranium oxide fuel, 96% mm -hmm. of which is waste. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, now we're going to do the same thing with thorium. Now we're starting with 280 tonnes of thorium monazite sand. So already we've shrunk the system remarkably, and we make uh, 1.34 tonnes of thorium fluoride salt, and we generate the power. Same amount. Same amount. Yeah. Mm. Now between 1% and 5% is still radioactive, as in it hasn't been uh, burned up in the reactions. Mm -hmm. right? And so this is the stuff you've got to store. It's about 50 it's much, much less. <laughs> 50 to 60 kilograms, and you store it for 300 years, not for 100,000. Wow. Right. So mm -hmm. it is... is What's interesting is it can run with uranium salt mix mm -hmm. with some SNF, but it also can, you can put spent nuclear fuel into the thorium system in small amounts and you can process it that way. So all that mm -hmm. nuclear stockpile that's down the bottom, that's actually fuel. Oh, so uh, we in Ontario have a major problem with a huge amount of nuclear waste. So would we be able to reprocess some of that nuclear waste for these Over time, reactors? Yes. Mm -hmm. Over time, and depending on what okay. the actual question. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a list of, um, uh, this, this list needs to be updated, but, um, there's a, there, there are groups of actually, this is what they're doing. Lots of groups mm -hmm. all around the world, and they're all deadly serious. And okay. they're all they pass through feasibility studies. Mm -hmm. And we don't know which one will work, but I went to physically see Copenhagen. So there's mm -hmm. the third page. Rolls Royce, look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they're cl claiming they haven't been doing it, but actually they have. Oh, all right. Wow. So this is a picture of me wearing a tie for the first time in 25 years. 
<laughs> and I happen to be standing in front of a test rig of a full-sized thorium nuclear reactor. Mm -hmm. Now, this is like an, a, it's a, it's the equivalent of a 20-foot container. It's a test rig. Mm -hmm. It tests the water circuit, but the mm -hmm. rig, the general, um, the nuclear reactor behind me is full size. It's a sphere. It's an onion configuration, and mm -hmm. that's and to the to my right is um, Thomas Shan P um, Pedersen. Right. Mm -hmm. So each commercial reactor is planned to produce 100 megawatts of thermal heat for 40 megawatts of electricity, and mm -hmm. each one is the size of a 40 foot shipping container when you know, with a full system together. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be made in the factory at a rate of one a day. They'll, they'll yeah. come online in 2028. Mm -hmm. They plan to sell electricity at two cents a kilowatt, where one gram of thorium or uranium produces 24 megawatt hours of thermal energy. Put that in context, mm -hmm. uh, 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 they're modular, so you can put lots of these things together. Let's say you want a plant producing 10, 10 gigawatts of electricity, so you've got a whole lot of them stacked together. You need 800 kilograms of thorium-232 metal each year in salt form. Mm -hmm. So the full test of the whole system, um, because this is in Copenhagen, they've got all these laws they've got to, and hoops they've got to jump through to allow this to happen. So it's really slow. Late mm -hmm. next, uh, late 2025 is actually when they're actually uh, going to actually generate electricity for the full site for in the full site but, uh, for the first time but i actually walked through the factory and they had about you know 20 maybe 30 test rigs each one testing one component and one oh, of them okay. was like a molten salt that was kept um molten with say like electric um just ele uh, electric heating mm -hmm. and it'd been circulating around the system for more than a year and so okay. that's sort of the tests they're doing so i saw the water mm -hmm. cycle working and i saw the um uh, salt working and so mm -hmm. all the radioactive uh, um, uh, tests have actually been done on another site and they will actually assemble them. So they plan to be selling these in 2028. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, the, I have a question. Yeah. I yeah. was wondering if uh, they're using um, a pump in the molten salt reactor or if they're just using convection. They wouldn't tell me. Oh, they wouldn't tell you. Okay. Um, it's a commercial secret, which is fair enough. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I was like easy way to tell if it was noisy or if it wasn't. It wasn't noisy. It wasn't noisy. So, so that would be convection. And I, th I think that's a more reliable way of doing it anyways. Yeah. So okay. um, the, these, and I looked inside these things. The components look fairly simple. Mm -hmm. And once you've got the components assembled, I don't think it's a big deal to actually assemble one of these a day if you've got a properly set up factory. So I reckon they can do it. Mm-hmm. And then it comes to ammonia. Right. Oh, okay. So, oh, so mm -hmm. um, I, I'm actually heading towards the purple transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so ammonia is um, Toyota, who have also been looking at my work. But, you know, all these groups around the world are looking at my work, but they won't acknowledge my existence, but I know they're using it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, yeah. So um, um, Toyota has actually released... Uh, a concept of an ammonia engine and they're what they're basically saying is electric vehicles won't work because of the resource problem and the infrastructure problem mm -hmm. uh, they also wanted to get out from under uh, Chinese influence and that was actually the mm -hmm. real decision for them they didn't want to be tied to the Chinese and so mm -hmm. they've developed a way of actually having a ammonia engine in a passenger car my I have two questions for this one they claim they're actually managing the exhaust so the exhaust gases are not toxic, like a catalytic conversion system, but I don't know how they're doing that. So I want to understand more of that. And the other pertinent question is, can we actually generate electricity? Can, can we actually make ammonia from seawater? Oh. Um, so the, the third part of the metal trans, uh, the, the purple transition is metal powder. So you can look at this if you want. So the idea is they take iron oxide or iron powder mm -hmm. and they burn it. Mm -hmm. And it and it, and it oxidizes and that releases a lot of heat. Where 500 kilograms of uh, iron powder produces one megawatt hour of um, heat. Uh, um, now the burn temperature is around 2,300 degrees Celsius, uh, but their systems are they're suggesting like 1,800 degrees in practice is not a problem. So we've got to replace coal. 
And so they also think then these guys think in terms of they're going to produce some um, you know, replace power generation as well. And so a lot of their thinking is a little conventional, but the, but they're also well advanced. And so this is the sort of thing that they're sort of looking at. So iron powder is actually sort of cycle efficiency is right up there with everything else. So did, Sorry. This this kind of reminds me of uh, the salvage economy because we're going to have all these, you know, skyscrapers standing around with lots of steel mm -hmm. in them and they could be uh, put down into powder and then used for these yeah. kinds of reactors. So there's a logistical thing there, but yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, this is all in the presentation people can go through if they like. Uh, so it goes through, you've seen this slide before, but every we've misunderstood the commodities sector. And when we're looking at, um, when we talk about energy, <coughs> it's really energy, but also what raw material it was sourced from, like a mineral, whether it's coal, oil, or gas, or now whatever mining mineral, whatever it is. Then there's the technology to extract and use it, and then there's the economics, and all of these are going to come from human, um, from the planetary environment. This is how we really are, and we just haven't really acknowledged that. And so, but our relationship with all is changing. Right now, it's moving to new territory. Mm -hmm. This is the purple transition. So we've got two wings: application, like what do we use the technology for, and then mm -hmm. how do we generate the um, um, energy to get there. But it's the application, mm -hmm. it's the push-pull thing. Is it push or is it pull? It's both. But anyway, we want transport, which at the moment is IC, petroleum, electricity, and manufacture. Now, manufacture at the moment relies heavily on heat, coal in particular. And I've yet mm -hmm. to hear anyone address that at all. So we've got coal, gas, and oil, and nuclear. Petroleum's going. Phase it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got all this stuff to actually just generate electrical, electrical power. We want solar and wind, apparently, to be the primary energy system to overtake fossil fuels. That's the projection. Mm -hmm. We've got these other things, like electric vehicles, biofuels, hydrogen fuel cells. Electric vehicles are not going to work in their current form because there's two problems here. One is the batteries, making the batteries, but the other is to manufacture the infrastructure associated with the charging of those batteries for 1.4 mm -hmm. billion vehicles. Mm -hmm. That and and that that is actually the the, the showstopper because the, um, the, the practicalities of that um, and and also the natural resources for that are actually more than the electric vehicles themselves. <coughs> biofuels cannot actually supply with this limited supply of biomass. The planet yeah. can't do that, so that's got to go. Hydrogen has limitations of the storage and transport of so much hydrogen. You can do it on a small scale. But mm -hmm. trying to do it at a large scale, I think the, the wheels fall off. And so mm -hmm. the, um, it, that's looking like that's impractical. So, so you've got the idea of the technology works for all of these things on a small scale. It's when you try and scale it up to be available for 8 billion people that, that, that things become difficult. Mm -hmm. Right. So solar and wind, the buffer to manage the intimacy of is the problem. It, and we don't have the technology to store such a large amount of power for such a long period of time. Even at the six-hour level, which is what conventional thinking believes, of course, you're never going to balance the difference between summer and winter, the solar yeah. of that. But, mm -hmm. yeah, but anyway, so I believe solar and wind will fail. Mm -hmm. So all these others, like hydro, geothermal, bio-waste, and wave, all work, but they can't really expand because there's geographical limitations of where you can put them. Yeah. So each one of them have their problems. That brings us to nuclear. So I know so conventional uranium light water reactors. I did a simulation and I found that they can't expand fast enough to be useful. Mm -hmm. It takes too long, even if they only took five years to build. And we brought on a net 25 new reactors every year. It was still not work. Yeah. And, and also, even if we did, we don't have the, Ukra uh, the uranium reserves. Yeah. And so what we'd we only have 10 years left. We can go off and find more, That's but, but the more serious problem is, well, to be useful, can we expand? No. Are we in a position to manage such a large amount of waste? No. No. Right. So, so there are problems there. And then there is, well, coal is for heat, if manufacture, and that's it's, it's really a heat economy, not an electricity economy. We need heat mm -hmm. for manufacture and electricity. Yeah. So we've got IC ammonia. Two questions. Can you manage the exhaust gas and can we produce our seawater? Remains to be seen, but so far looks okay. 
but if you've got heat, well, maybe you can. Then we've got the liquid fuel fission, you know, thorium molten salt uh, concept. Mm -hmm. So far, that's standing up, but I can see some problems of expansion. Like, that's not going to be the magic solution, but it's going to be a solution. But it does deliver the heat, but the heat is not good enough. Mm. And so I think that might become a very important energy source. So it's now mm. going to look like this. This is what we're now. So on one side, we've got icy ammonia. The other side, we've got liquid thorium. And the third mm -hmm. piece of technology is combustion of iron oxide powder to produce temperatures, and that can actually supply and manufacture. And I call this the purple transition. Ah. ah, 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 ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's anyway. cool. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the presentation. So, yeah, yeah I wanted to uh, quickly, while you're still here, share a little bit about the transition I was working on. I'll turn my Here. camera off. I'm, I'm actually eating dinner, so I got to turn. My okay, that, that's 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 fine. Um, here, so it's it's somewhat different because I, I decided to uh, start with uh, the family level, um, like w what can provide for a family, and uh, so if if you have the land to grow your own food and firewood, then you could do your heating with the firewood, and then you just have the solar panels for a uh, basic LED lighting, you know, like a smartphone, a laptop, that kind of thing. And then uh, for the uh, community level, it would be uh, basically scaling that up, but uh, you could also have uh, horses or ox for uh, transportation because you wouldn't be able to do that on a family level since uh, e each horse or ox needs as much land as a human. Uh, but w within a community of 50 to 60, which is the uh, optimal for uh, well, any human community, uh, you, you'd be able to spare a hectare or two for, for a transportation uh, animal. Mm -hmm. And then for the uh, village level, uh, it's actually big enough that if they all get their poop together, uh, they can uh, create enough biogas to uh, power one vehicle, one uh, bio CNG, compressed natural gas vehicle, uh, for I think it was like 180 kilometers. Anyways, it, it, enough for for traveling uh, to uh, say a, a community point, like to the nearby city for resupply and waste disposal. As as well, they could use the biogas uh, CNG for um, things like uh, blacksmithing, uh, lime or any of the other things that we would traditionally use charcoal for because there's absolutely no way of growing enough charcoal because there's it's a 10 to 1 ratio you would need to burn hundreds of hectares of wood in order to uh, do anything useful uh, with it so the biogas allows you to reach those temperatures uh, without actually burning any extra thing here i had here lime production so so blacksmith is one to three cubic meters of bio CNG metal casting two to five glass making two to six uh, wood shepherd two to six ceramic kiln two to five lime production four to eight and the van uses uh, 30 you know 32 cubic meters for a full tank and then so from 360 people there uh, the bio CNG they could produce per week is uh, 40 uh, or something uh, cubic meters. Uh, so so it's enough to do that basic stuff at the local level. Um, and then at the uh, neighborhood level, uh, they'd be able to like store, you know, the bio CNG uh, for like refueling uh, and things like that and have a farmer's market going. And then at the city level, like what you were thinking of, um, so this would be 55,000 people, then you would have at the city level, you would have a thorium reactor uh, for industry and making the solar panels and things like that. Um, and then at the, well, well, the county level, it would just kind of, uh, I, ha I haven't really gotten to the other layers, uh, but yeah, I was just thinking, Simon, uh, if, if that would help uh, with what you're, you're thinking. It and, doesn't look uh, good. I, I would say from personal, what I look at so far, the county level is going to be the most important. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. You'll have a network of towns. That's, that's yeah. going to be where it's at. 
yeah so so that's going to be yeah several so so what i got in the county so there'll be county radio so i uh talked to uh my county council on a regular basis and uh recently uh well i was telling them about the importance of having a county radio network and now they're planning a five million dollar radio booster station um and so that would provide at least radio connectivity for our uh, what do you call it? richest <laughs> municipality of Blue Mountains because uh, they got a lot of tourism and stuff. And so they would be able to use uh, the radio, com the booster station for both one-on-one uh, -on -one communications for coordinating groups all over the municipality, as well as having the FM radio station to uh, tell the residents, you know, what's going on in the municipality. And then you could network these FM uh, radio stations in order to allow uh, that to happen. So, oh, uh, for a county radio, it would be 10 to 20 kilowatts, but uh, they're doing a, a municipal radio, which is five, oh, one to five kilowatts right now. Um, and then there would also be the education, which would be uh, colleges, universities, and healthcare, and things like that. Uh, Leon? Yeah, a question for Simon. Um, mm -hmm. can, can you hear me? I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a big factor now uh, is going to be time. Yeah. Uh, reference to getting all this uh, honing down on what exactly is the right path regards to the future. <coughs> Have we got enough time based on the information we know reference to fossil fuels, uh, diminishing oil, um, and the resource and money that's being injected in the wrong way forward. Do we have enough time? That's my first question. Second question is regards to the Venus project. Is it being designed for a post a kind of post-capitalist society which has already disintegrated uh, opposed to a mitigation to inject into the ill society, if you get my drift. Right. Uh, now, for a start, my meeting's not in three minutes. It's actually in 33 minutes. It's at 5.30, not 5. It's been delayed, so we can stay on for longer. Oh, cool. Uh, so... Right, so um, time is a problem. Now, um, my answers to that, and, and this has actually become from uh, a number of conversations with, with, with people, and, and this is brutal. Of so many people have pushed back and so many people have been quite rude. How many people have you tried to discuss with these basic problems and not only will they not engage, but they'll take the time to actually destroy what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. Right. And so instead of actually trying to develop a solution for everyone, I'm now thinking in terms of I would much rather be helping people like Doom or people who are already doing stuff, people who are like minded people who got, you know, or at least can have a conversation. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I say, do we have time? Well, it depends on time for what? Are we going to actually build a system for 8 billion people or are we going to build a system for, say, uh, 40 or 50 communities across the planet that, that, that mm -hmm. might have an extended network of, say, 100 million people. Right. Second, we don't know which one of these systems will work because we haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. We like to think we do, but, but everyone that's tried stuff, it's, it's shown to have shortfalls. So what has to happen is all solutions need to hit the ground running in pilot scale. And we need to mm -hmm. have a go and learn... Fuck about and find out in engineering yeah. terms, right? So yeah, we need yeah. to people go for it. <laughs> and then here's the important part. We need to tell each other how it's going. So instead mm. of saying, I will now rule the world, I've got the solution, the rest of you bunnies are going to be in my kingdom where I'm king, or you're going to starve to this. No, 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 no. Right. So, so mm -hmm. we're decentralizing. And so we're going to see right. a massive yeah. diversity of solutions on the ground Lots and lots and lots of communities, each one trying their own thing. 
and we have to have like some kind of communication network between them all what works what doesn't exchange of information and if possible exchange of resources now what i'm mm -hmm. planning is a gateway i call it a gateway city where i'm going to demonstrate a series of technologies i'm in a place that's the desert so it's going to be very hard to be self-sufficient but it's going to mm -hmm. make certain things possible which then can be telescoped all over the world like what like i've been to dunes community in northern new south wales and it's remarkable imagine oh, well wow. if you will is what would happen if dune actually had one of these thorium reactors arrive on a truck and now we had all of a sudden 40 megawatts of electricity to play with mm -hmm. yeah that would be uh enough to would it be enough to make some solar panels so no i don't think we want one yet <laughs> Well, the, 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 the most renewable power source is students in a pamster wheel. Um, so you need power, that's what you need. Um, you know, just make them run, you know. You know uh, Promise will mm -hmm. sign their paperwork and they'll you know, run, run, you bastard. Um, so, right. Mm -hmm. so, so each of these groups are going to have to sort of to develop and, and they'll make something possible. It's going to be like the wild, wild west, but in innovation terms. But that innovation is not going to be in universities anymore. At the moment, I've, I've come to the point where that map that I showed you, the purple transition, that will be a massive surprise to all the research groups I'm part of. Because the, the, the adverse um, attitude where they don't want to talk about anything unusual or controversial or something that actually might be negative, which means mm -hmm. they are completely blindsided and have a pants down moment when reality intrudes. Oh, right. So, so everyone who actually has been shouting lithium batteries at me for the last five years have been wasting their time and mine. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Right, right. And so, so innovation, breakthrough innovation is not coming out of our institution. It's coming from somewhere else. Right. Private mm -hmm. sector can't do it, but somehow private sector is involved. Academia can't do it, but somehow they're involved. Government certainly can't do it, but somehow they're involved. It's like an entity that does not... And what I'm actually forming is I'm, I'm trailblazing into an area where no one is there at the moment. But this is not the first time this has happened. I'm not the first to have this basic idea. Right. So um, innovation is going to land in each of these... Like, uh, Andrew, if you're successful in making your community, you'll have a group of people and they'll be living. What do they do? If they're established and stable, but lots of people aren't you have a responsibility not a responsibility but an opportunity to actually do something cool to change the world mm -hmm. because you can do it and they can't every yes. single community around the world will be in that position stability can only happen if you've got enough food to eat or if you've yep. got enough energy or enough electricity or you're not at war with your neighbors over resources yep. right yeah this thing we call education well, how do we maintain that yeah. Oh, well, I have, I will do, I have a few points. Um, well, one of them, uh, you, you were talking about that network of communities all over the globe. And uh, if, if the internet goes down, uh, at least the regular internet for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there, there's um, HF radio or shortwave radio. Yep. And uh, at the country level, it would be 50 to 250 kilowatts uh, would be suffice for public broadcast for a country. And for um, for a province, it would be twenty two hundred kilowatts. But but I would imagine that if, if it's that range, uh, you would still you would be able to contact uh, all over the globe um, these different communities if you had uh, a high power uh, shortwave radio well, transmission. I'm, I'm planning to have a big uh, satellite link, a big, big satellite. Link. And mm. um, if I can become mates with Elon, I'd like I'd like my own personal satellites, and I can be a real wanker. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, other people would have to have them too, then. You know. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and then I I, I did watch this. Um, you you know how Klaus Schwab has been talking about the uh, the cyber hackers, uh, yeah. you know, taking everything down. And I watched a movie about uh, the uh, you know from Netflix about the cyber hack. And in it, even the satellites go down. Uh, so, and only the um, shortwave radio guys um, could manage to maintain communication uh, because that's local and they had it in their, um, what do you call it, uh, Faraday cage bunkers. Mm.
because a high altitude burst or whatever uh, would take all that out. Um, there's a lot of science fiction that's useful. The story mm -hmm. of the postman, uh, whoever wrote yeah. the postman, I can't remember the other, but it was the idea of a postal service was how uh, communities could communicate with each other and then give aid if they needed it. Uh, mm -hmm. But then they had the, uh, when you read the book itself, uh, the main character comes across um, a broken down vehicle that's crashed, and but the owner, the driver, was still it was dead, but had a postman's jacket on. And mm -hmm. some letters and one of the letters when you open them all up was communication to one of the communities was with uh, trying to get some uh, agreement you, you show us this we'll show you that we've got this you've got that uh so mm -hmm. it could be something like that you know like, like where someone will actually carry a, a, a written dispatch mm -hmm. and they'll travel a yeah. long way to do it mm -hmm. yeah that's, yeah for uh, the cities uh connecting each other I was thinking the best thing would be uh, a traditional railway. It costs one tenth as much as an asphalt road per kilometer, um, and uh, requires much less energy to get it going. So it, it, it could work, anyways, uh, I, I, on the local level, like as a as a reboot, as part of the reboot. Anyhow, and, and in terms of the food production, uh, you, you know, I've been <laughs> looking heavily into that for decades, and so the the best thing is the food forests. And so, it in in your community of uh, that you're you're planning on setting up, it would make sense to um, have that as the base plan of uh, when you're before you you start doing any um, what do you call it changes to the actual. Uh, you know taking the tops off mountains and things like that because the thing is the tops of mountains can be a very good uh source of water uh because uh, like uh for instance you know like the pyramids and um uh, basically like trees that what they do is they change the atmosphere uh they change the pressure and they create a low pressure area where like the clouds accumulate on top of it and then then the water comes down so you do want to have tall mountains uh but you also want swales to catch those uh catch the water when it falls and then you want plants that will absorb that water and yeah biotic pump as uh, ivor was saying ivor did you want to add to that or um, but yeah, so I would recommend getting a uh, permaculturist like Jeff Lawton or someone else to come in there and uh, have them part of that process because food is so essential. You want to create a permaculture system that will provide you food so uh, on a regular basis so that you don't have to worry about uh, tilling and uh, all those kinds of things. And uh, you can focus on the other aspects of your community uh, like, uh, you know, the minerals and those other things. Yeah, the biotic pump. Um, I uh, when I lived in Guatemala, there was an old Mayan guy, and this old Mayan guy said, um, "Oh, it's too bad that they're cutting down all the trees, because the trees call the water." And I remember sort of laughing about it, like, "Oh, right, the trees call the water," but as it turns out, they've done a lot of um, research, and uh, what actually happens is uh, there's almost like a little um, microclimate. All those trees send up. Um, uh, droplets and those droplets attract clouds and the clouds to sort of sit on the top of a um, hill or a mountain and drop their load of water coming in from the ocean they say it can go up to 200 miles from the uh, ocean and it's a regular thing i watch it every day in the summer on uh i live on a little island in maine and we see uh thunder clouds they don't hit here they hit up 100 you know they don't hit on the island they hit a hundred miles inland and they drop their load of water every single day on uh, forested places. So I think it's really interesting that the biotic pump works. And uh, if you cut down too many trees, it quits working. That's what happened yeah. to this. To, uh, oh. the leaf. Before we do anything in anger, everything is going to be studied to death and discussed to death mm -hmm. by literally hundreds of people who are qualified. I'll be the CEO mm -hmm. of this operation which means the work won't be done by me, it'll be done by people I employ. So we'll get the relevant mm. people together and, and we're going to do it and we will understand the watershed both above mm -hmm. the ground and below the ground. Every 20 years they have these massive floods that come through the area and wash away all the topsoil, which is why the area is, done, um, is the way it is. Mm. Yeah. So uh, we're going to try and catch that water so it doesn't wash everything away and it becomes a long-term resource. 
Yeah. Um, so everything will be integrated together into one system, not just the permaculture, not just the fire systems and greening the desert, but also the city that we want to live, which we will need water and we will need things and, and food and resources and the industrial systems that we want to put on the ground as well have to be all integrated together into one balanced system. And then once we actually sort of understand what we're doing, then we start digging things up. Mm -hmm. so that's the, that okay. sounds to reinvent yeah. agriculture, right? Here's the plan. We're going to get everyone around the table. So we're actually looking at this site. We've got all the information we've collected from the geological surveys and the marine surveys. We've run a pristine coast and we need to know what's in front of us. We will have around the table um, people who do organic agriculture of every stripe, uh, from you know, you know, re regenerative agriculture all the way to the conventional or organics. There's now lots of different subcategories all around the table. Around the same table is going to be practitioners of existing horticultural science. That, yes, we're trying to phase it out, but there's an enormous amount of science that's been done and knowledge that's been assembled together. Everyone's around the table and says, right, the metric to this, this is the environment we're working with, and this is the information associated with it. You have 60 millimeters of water a year, right? And we, we're going to try and not interact with that. We have to avoid the, the 20 year cycle of floods. You're not allowed to use industrial agri uh, industrial petrochemical fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides. We need to build, um, build life systems and soil systems, and we're not allowed to use GMOs either. We want to get to the point where we can produce as, as close to self-sufficiency for our community as possible, and we want to be growing hemp and bamboo um, uh, products as well. We also want to be doing aquaculture, uh, both, both um, marine aquaculture and conventional aquaculture. Go. And then we have a discussion back and forth, and no one will have the answer. And the outcome that will be will be a combination of everyone around the table, and it will be the, a genuine first. We will see it for the first time. And, yeah. and whatever site we go to, we have to do this. This guy, Daniel Sandweiss, might be useful to you because he has been studying the interaction of the El Nino and the uh, water cycle. And he said, yeah, there are periodic, like, like you say, every 20 years or something, and there are these floods. Well, they, they, a lot of them um, correspond with the uh, El Nino cycle and also the rise and fall of different um, uh, small cultures have all gone with the uh, El Nino cycle, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And I, I wanted to say, yeah, the main thing to uh, avoid the washing away of the topsoil is establishing permaculture crops because they, they, their roots will hold the soil together and prevent it from washing away. And it, in, bamboo is a very water uh, intensive crop, but uh, I know ice cream bean is um, the fastest growing drought tolerant tree that I'm aware of. And well, it's uh, as the name uh, suggests, it's very delicious. <laughs> So yeah, As, we'll, and it's a South American native. See, if if we are wind up on a different site, we'll be looking at bamboo, but certainly hemp, where we're looking at, because it doesn't need very much water. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. um, all, all of those things will be sort of looked at, but it has to be balanced off against everything else. Now, there's a whole mm -hmm. lot of archaeological sites in the area that we're looking at, which is complicating the hell out of where I'm going to put my city, because uh, mm -hmm. the, where I've got it now is on the only flat piece of land. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, if I may, I can actually share a picture of the map that I've got at the moment. Okay, sure. So, um, taking a while to load was apparently at large. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, where are you? Okay, sharing. Okay, I'll unshare mine. All right, that's what we're looking at. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, it's a very hilly area. We've, um, around the uh, coastline, we've got cliffs about 50 meters tall. And then we're sort of going up. This is probably sitting about 300 meters above sea level. Mm -hmm. and 200 meters above sea level, something like that. Uh, okay. And we've got, uh, but uh, all of these industrial sites here, we're going to have to move them probably to over the road. Now, over the road, we've got lots of hilly mountainous terrain, uh, which we're going to have to now terrace. And I'm not afraid of terracing because you know, in a drill and blast operation in a mine site, that's what we do. We actually move a lot of earth and we terraform the whole place. Mm -hmm. 
And it turns out lots of cultures in the past have terraformed the place they put the city on, and it, that, that's why we see such long and old ruins. So, um, anyway, that's, mm -hmm. I'm sure you get the point. So, wow. Well, it's it's an ambitious project for sure. No, or the, getting, go hard, go large, or go home. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's true. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think if you can get the right people in into the mix, and um, you know, like like you described it, an innovation hub, there, there's absolutely no reason why uh, you can't get an outcome and a and a and a, and a movement towards. Yeah, something. well, most most of what I need to do has already been done. I just need to put the pieces together. Mm. Most of what I need to do to be successful, I don't have to develop anything. I just have to. Put her on the ground. You connect it together. And so what then happens from that foundation is the innovation. But I'm actually highly confident of being successful if I can get the capital together. Because it's already are there. Are you concerned about uh, reference to the capital that um, you're, you're going to be looking for capital? You're, you're looking for investors mm -hmm. that are essentially looking to... to Get, get a return on their investment, right? Yeah, yeah, to a point. There are lots of investors. There's a lot of money out there looking to land. Like the Saudis spent $50 billion building one of their uh, concept cities. Mm. Mm. These people throw around trillions of dollars like it's nothing. Yeah. Right, so yeah. this is not a lot of money. We just need to get the right people. What we want yeah. is what we call legacy investors, people who want their family name associated with developing the next generation of human civilization. And whatever we do here, it will take time, but there are revenue streams coming off this thing. So if I may share, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Viability of Venus Evolution. Right, so the idea, there's, there's, there's three things that actually are generating revenue. First, there's the intellectual property hub. So there's a lot of intellectual property coming out which can be commercialized. I want to be attracting innovators from all over the world where they don't get screwed in the commercialization process. And if we, because I used to be an inventor, I know how to, to do that. It involves less money for the inventor. Second is engineering product production of unusual products. Like if we recycle rubber tires, then make uh, get carbon black and we make graphene products. Now we can start selling graphene products. Then there is the unorthodox sourcing of commodities. And that's all the stuff I'm still looking at at the moment. So you've got three stream of saleable products that will generate revenue. The first, set of costs to actually take that revenue down is the operational cost of running the city and associated industrial sites and with what's left can be sent as royalty streams back to investors mm -hmm. and that's how i'll be talking to money at the moment we need donations donations handed into the venus project to get us going and once going uh, i'm going to suit up and go and go and catch a couple of big fish I, I was thinking that a uh, good source of donations would be uh, those uh, prepper millionaires and billionaires like Mark, Mark Zuckerberg who was recently making that bunker mm -hmm. um, in uh, Hawaii. Uh, that was in the news. And, you know, there's lots and lots of uh, millionaires and hundred millionaires uh, that are doing that. And so, I mean, if you had like a little call center uh, to call the Forbes list or whatever and ask them if they're interested, I think uh, some of them would be. Yeah, that's that's another stream. See, there's lots of ways to get money, right? What we want mm -hmm. is get money in with the strings that are attached to that money are not going to interrupt the design of the city. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yeah. so, yeah. The, right. And so one of the things could be, for example, um, donate 100 million um, US dollars to our um, cause, and you can have one of the um, apartments in the cities, one of the house, right. one of the homes in the city, and mm -hmm. uh, you've got a community around you, and that's that's your plan. Yeah, for you and your family. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking a lot of them might be interested in uh, because like some of them are just so rich they don't know what to do with their money. Yeah. And uh, so if, if you, you offer them, yeah, either an apartment or a lot right. or, 
or whatever, um, then uh, they would be willing to do that with even with your, uh, you know, no strings attached or, or very few strings attached uh, because they're also doing other projects in other places. And this would be just a backup for them. And they could yeah. just, you know, give you a hundred million or whatever. For there them. is a shitload of money that is circling looking for a place to land, knowing that the system is done. Mm -hmm. And exactly. the whole Western world's going down. Um, there's going to be a divorce of all things East and all things West. Um, mm -hmm. Europe is in deeper shit than usual. Um, America does have the potential uh, to, to reinvent itself. Europe, Europe is making sure it doesn't. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of money looking for a place to land. Mm -hmm. Australia and Canada are both looking more stupid than usual. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's true. Oh, I had a few questions left from uh, people. Um, uh, from, from the PQL group, how do we help the general public overcome energy blindness? Ah, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that question. Because, uh, as it turns out, most people like their energy blindness. So, yes. um, yeah. So, <laughs> it's a comforting delusion. <laughs> So, pain is a great teacher. It could be the people... We're seeing it now. Electricity prices are going through the roof here in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I believe it's a direct consequence of geopolitical monkey business. Um, and, and there's a lot of political forcing to make green transition happen without thinking through what's needed for that. Right? So, there's, there's, there's problems with that. And people say, well, why, why is that? So they're thinking about it for the first time. Instead of trying to tell people the bleeding obvious, which has been happening for the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, for some people. Um, find a group of like-minded people, go and create something successful, and as things get difficult, people will observe their success. Uh, why is that then? Ah, oh, well. And mm -hmm. then they'll get it. It's trying to laugh yeah. when it happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, another we're, we're in collapse. So this this civilization is going down, and um, it, as you say, Simon, it's too late. Um, and uh, what you're trying to do is still utilize the technologies that we've created from um, you know uh, the, the growth of this civilization. I don't think that we're going to make anything like what's required for eight billion people. Nope. So the, you know. The population of the Earth is just too great for, for what we've done. And I don't know what we can do other than to uh, collapse back to small groups that are small enough to not want to fight one another um, below Dunbar's number. And um, it's pretty simple to grow food if you're in the right place with the right kind of climate and to survive in a small group and... Um, you know, maybe that small group's going to be attacked by another group and um, we're not going to survive either. But, uh, you know, that's about as, as, as best that we're going to be able to do in the future, I believe, and, and we're going to have to grow from nothing. So I've got an idea for you. Um, I recently watched the Foundation uh, TV series on Apple, which, I don't know, I, I just want to read the book again. The book, the book did it so much better. Harry Seldon was the mathematician in that book that they, who kicked off the whole thing. And he had the basic idea of um, the empire was about to come apart at the seams and was going to go into a dark age 30,000 years long. What he suggested was forming the, the found, what was the foundation, which is like a, a colony of, of intellectuals far away from everyone else. And that would set off a chain reaction that would make that dark age only last a thousand years instead of 30,000. Mm -hmm. right. And maybe that's what we're doing. Yeah. You know, there, there'll be part, the future's here, but it's unequal. It's not distributed mm -hmm. equally. There'll be parts of the world which might be okay, mm -hmm. and parts of the world would definitely won't be okay. But the parts that are okay, if they could actually maintain our existing capability somehow, and then, then that can be transferred later when... Everyone else has a clue. And, and dude, I wanted to address your point. So um, basically, 
you were saying if we were a small community and then someone else might invade. So I think, uh, like I was thinking about that too. And the best thing mm -hmm. I found is to help kind of the area transition. And so if you could go to your local county council or your local municipal council and, uh, you know, regularly attend so they know who you are because they have the boots on the ground, they've got the batons or the guns or whatever. Uh, they're going to be doing their best to maintain order through this transition. And if you give them, if you help them see that there is a viable way to do that, even for, even if it's just that select group of uh, counselors or and their uh, henchmen, uh, then uh, they're, then you're going to have a much higher chance of survival for your little group. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, but um, the way I see it is that uh, if, we, if if people observe what's going on and, and people observe that we that there's there are certain groups that are looking like they're doing things that uh, allow them to survive, then rather than uh, come in and, and um, knock them off, that they'll try and emulate the same kind of thing. So if you're in an area where there's enough natural resources, including water, soil, and uh, climate and um, you'll be able to grow food in, in your own little way and somewhere uh, 10 kilometres away there'll be another group that are doing the same thing So uh, and, and somehow it's going to emerge from that somewhere I'm, I'm kind of connecting with a local grange and the grange is kind of you know okay it's kind of a more abundant institution but the local grange there were a whole bunch of people who were sort of Hippie back to the landers who uh, had a little group and their uh, their place, uh, the snow mushed the roof down, so it's gone. So they all joined the East Madison Grange. And the Grange was, you know, patrons of husbandry. They were kind of like a little group that was kind of radical in their day, you know, the free silver movement and all the, uh, the William Jennings Bryan thing. And uh, they uh, are kind of on the upswing again. And there are a lot of sort of interesting young people actually that are involved with it. So I figured just sort of encourage them and we'll try to get it going. And we also have a, a small uh, radio station, which is just two, three Watts right now, but we may be going to a hundred Watts and uh, we are going to have a, a kind of a, uh, we call it an extravaganza where we have music, different things and art and things happening. Uh, and we're going to do it at the East Madison Grange. So it's kind of like we're encouraging this little group to get together and make uh, make up uh, the community again of mm -hmm. small farmers and people like us. So I don't know. It's a sort of a uh, you know much simpler thing than everything else, but uh, it seems to be working. I think well, Simon touched touched on it well, didn't he? Earlier, in regards to communication. <laughs> and collaboration right and helping other people yeah exactly i was just wondering if you guys had any last questions for simon because he's got to go in two minutes um i do have a little uh, a question what about the people who live actually in south peru i know they've been uh in that part of peru i know they had a uh, there was a i have a coin that's at uh south peru ocho reales it comes from that area, and uh, there have been people, movements there for many, many years. You know, Bruce split up. This was in 1830s, 1840s. So I'm just curious about what, how are you going to deal with the people who are actually there, the Peruvianos? The land we're looking at is deserted. It's privately owned, and we're talking to the owners, right? And, and then, look, most people are in a town or a city called Araquilpa and Quilca, and they're a couple yep. hundred kilometers away. For a couple of hundred kilometers in every direction, right, there is desert with no people living there because there's no water and there's no facilities and there's no nothing. Oh, okay. It's not one of those fertile valleys. Nope. Okay. No, no, okay, no. okay. We don't want to be in competition with someone else's resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Half, the, half the country doesn't have enough drinking water or access to sort of sanitation. And we no. might be able to help them with that. But we can't mm. arrive and say, right, we're going to take those resources now because we've got the money. And they'll say, mm. oh, you're just another gringo here to save the world. But you're really yeah. just going to exploit us. I want to mm. land in an area where no one else has actually developed yet. And so if people mm. come to us, they come to us because of what we've actually developed, and they'll help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
that's that sounds like a good plan yeah and 100 kilometers that's that's far enough away and especially if you got those mountains that uh you, you probably won't have too many people uh walking over there post collapse we are planning to have a security presence there mm -hmm. i'm studying documents like the united states constitution in particular there's also another like the magna carta and, and, and all that but how do we actually evolve to the point where people on the ground had power Mm -hmm. um, and we're thinking in terms of like, well, how do we band together as a community so we have resilience, mm -hmm. genuine yeah. resilience on all fronts. And in, in, in that regard, I would recommend looking into the ICCPR and the ICESCR, uh, w w which are international treaties which Peru has already signed. And uh, they're very similar. They're kind of like the best of the, the American Constitution and the Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. Put together uh, back in you know the seventies or whatever, uh, post uh, World War Two, so Canada be, helped put them together. <laughs> there'll be people other than me to look at all that who are more qualified, and they will be discussing it for years. Mm -hmm. In the short term, we are going to be a private company with a job to do with a security ring in the okay. desert, far away from <laughs> everyone. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. So I'm all going right. to disappear over the horizon with a group of like-minded people. And I will come back in 10 years, whenever it is time, with an entirely new proposition, and then we will do business. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, well don't, don't get completely out of touch. <laughs> you know, we want to network those communities all across the globe. When I swear they could have a project in Peru. Oh, I don't speak Spanish yet, no. Okay, I'm just saying good luck with your project in Peru. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah. there's a, we have a lot of support. Um, a lot of people are pushing back and they're trying to sort of tell me that, nah, nah, that's not possible. Wow. Uh, anyway, I've got to go, guys. I've got work okay, to do. Okay, see you. Mm -hmm. All right. Go on the Venus. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay. So, uh, Leon, you, you did you want to do your presentation now or do you want to save it for another time? Uh, well, we can do if, if, if you think it's in line with what we've been talking about. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Well, we might as well. We're it in the kind of is. It kind of is. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. So, oh, you, it, did, yeah. You, oh, did you want to share it? Oh, you want me to share it? I thought uh, you, would, you, oh, you were going to share it. Yeah. But, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let, hold on. Let me load it up. It would be quicker, uh, probably, for you to do it, to be fair. Yeah. Just my, my computer was under a lot of load for some reason, uh, probably with all of these things at the same time. Um, I had it open somewhere here. Well, that's Simon's presentation. Recent. Here, you sent it to my email. If, if you have it open, it'll probably be easier just to share from your end. Okay. Let me have a yeah. look. Yeah. I'll, I'll try it from this side, too. So, so, yeah, Dune and Ivor, you guys can talk for now while we're well, trying to do this. I, I'm just uh, I'm interested in it, and I think, Dune, you know, you're sort of doing it, uh, having a, uh, an actual place, you know, an actual community. And uh, your experience with how it actually works. <laughs> how it doesn't work, in fact. Uh, yeah, I mean. I the main reason it doesn't work is because of people. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. because of technology and not because of, of uh, natural resources. Yeah. That, that, you know, we're in a place where it would work if, if it wasn't for people. Um, and, and this is where, like, I originally thought that Dunbar's number was the thing that's uh, going to drive the, uh, the size of the of the community you're going to you're going to uh, create uh, less than a hundred people, uh, but it's it's even hard with twenty or thirty. Oh, yeah. Because of course, of uh, it, uh, you know, we're all uh, built around our own selfishness. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Oh, well, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And, and like I was saying, I've, I've read a lot of books on how to make a successful intentional community. Oh, Leon, we did see your presentation. Um, 
so and uh, what is necessary is to have a unified belief system like uh, like you know Jesus decided yeah, like like hmm. yeah you basically yeah. you need to have a, a religion of some kind otherwise it just won't work like even the kibbutzes uh, yeah. they were they were basically socialist youth groups they had their own religion it was communism you know and uh, but they were not very successful because <laughs> communism isn't very very kind or compassionate system uh but uh, the the most successful systems historically are are the anabaptists and they follow that jesus discipleship yeah. of you know forgive and love one another yeah and then there's also the, the muslims are also very successful uh they, they have very strong family groups and they they also you know they also have religion which is islam right and so basically we, uh, unless you have a religion it's just not going to work like that they they found like uh I, i've read books about people trying to f start a secular thing and it just falls apart and falls apart and falls apart it, it they, they never work uh it's just not possible to do it unless you have a unified belief system uh that has spiritual element. okay leon so 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 you you can share that we saw the first slide anyways but then you, you did see it. it yes it's, yes we did all, but believe it or not this is all it, it's all in chinese I can't work. I can't read it. <laughs> oh, you can't read. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, well, you could just click on the next. Now? Yeah, yeah. We can see it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so go right, next. So if I if I do that, can you see it? Uh, um, no. Click on the next slide. Yeah, just click on the next slide. We can just what? do it yeah, with the open. Hmm. Yeah. Local right. is the sound yeah. of localization. You can see it yes. now. Yes, yeah. we can see all the slides but, and but we we can't see uh, the presentation mode. Don't go into the presentation mode. Just oh, just the next slide. Yeah. Okay. There now just is. click on Y. Yeah. Click on the second slide. I got you. Okay. Yeah. There okay. you go. See, you could just all click right. on the slide. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So 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 this is so this was the logo that I created uh, mm -hmm. based on um, it, humans and their interaction or their their their. Um, What's the word for it? They're, they're connect their connection to nature, right? So the, mm -hmm. the oak tree in the middle and the, the the roots going into the hands and the kind of kiddish writing because it's really for the kids, right? Yes. Uh, for the kids' futures. Uh, why? Uh, well, loc is the sound of local localization. So it's just a gimmicky type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to help local people create security locally through building localization to become more independent from fossil fuels and more dependent on local habitat and land. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Loc uh, mission statement, rebuilding localization, putting nature first. So I think that's quite important. Um, mm -hmm. We've lost a lot of, uh, especially in our local uh, built up infrastructure areas, we've lost a lot of that uh, natural habitat, right? So um, uh, also through intensive agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, the missions to sequester land, uh, reintroduce natural habitat, create a closed loop system with no rate uh, waste through permaculture regenerative farming and togetherness yeah so so i have a question here uh, in terms of the sequester land but because you know i'm a, a distributionist or distributist and so i believe that everyone needs to have enough land to grow their own food and if we uh sequester it in the hands of very few people it usually doesn't work uh, like do, yeah. like a, a lot of the issues dune seems to be having Right. Okay. Uh, it, it seems to be from um, the fact that people don't have their own land, and then they have to kind of cooperate and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, this is very, very early stages and and kind of early ideas and thinking. So, um, okay. You know, to talk to local councils because they still do own quite a lot of land. Um, mm -hmm. I know that there was one huge farm bought bought by the council recently uh, near 
near to my hometown on the basis that they don't want it to be built on and developed. Um, but they're just going to use it as a place where people can walk their dogs and they're going to open that area up. They're not going to continue it as a farm or generate it into a permaculture farm or regenerative farming. Um, mm. They're just going to hold that land. Uh, so crowdfunding attempts to sequester land, find um, wasted artificial, natural, cosmetically developed land to develop into useful habitat. So I'm talking about areas of uh, suburban areas which have been planted up to make it look pretty, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Can those areas be sequestered for growing food and uh, growing more natural uh, habitat? I know also Scotland uh, is trying to do this and uh, they bought an island to use as a cooperative. Um, and they did not have an, a sub allocation for each family. And so it's also kind of not going anywhere because mm. everyone wants to be the boss and no one wants to do the work <laughs> and nobody yeah. owns anything. And so you, you plant things and then someone else comes along and harvests it. And so they don't have any kind of incentive to do anything because they don't have private land ownership. Uh, so, so it's not really working uh, in that sense. Yeah. 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 I, I think, I think, my my kind of thought process was to kind of say say you know my local local town has twenty thousand people living there you know this is you know this is going to get out to a certain amount of people in that area and maybe we can develop something just for the people that want to get involved in this type of thing mm -hmm. it's not necessarily something that's going to save everybody from uh the future yeah. But it could be a seed to then develop further into the community, you know, and maybe as time goes on, more and more land can be sequestered to develop this type of thing in the local I, area. I know I looked into uh, the historic organization in Britain and they had a single field for a village um, and then they would do the crop rotation by like it was like a circle and then we do like one third and then another third and then another third and then like later on when the population was bigger and they couldn't do the two fallow fields they would do one half and then the other half um and uh, but it so it looked like it was owned by the commons but if you actually found out what they were doing uh each family owned certain rows so so there was still private property even though they within the common so uh, your family would own like row one and row two, and then the other family would own two, uh, three and four. And then that way you still had your own private row, even though the field was in common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, up in the, in uh, Yellen's hometown uh, or home village, they, they have their own separated bits of private land within, within the valley. And then when you walk up through the mountain, they know exactly which fruit trees they own. And they seem to be fairly, um, uh, you know, uh, organized. Yeah, well, I'm not, I, I don't even think the fruit trees are necessary on their land, but because they grew it, it's their fruit tree. Um, oh, cool. But then further up the mountains, they, they actually own, you know, a mountain. Mm -hmm. So it's... And is is this in China? Yeah, um, but but they're they're you know they're very they're very sharp on protecting their 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 land, you know. Okay. Even even I, with, with with the village, which would have no doubt been fairly incestual uh, at mm -hmm. some stage. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Well, can we? Uh, I, I just have only a few minutes left. If you wanted to quickly go through. Your yeah, well, if ba basic, basically, um, you know, it's, it's just around, I want it to be around education. So it starts to educate local people into more deep skills. Um, mm -hmm. And we can flick them, flick through them, looking for local volunteers and partners, wandering walks, fundraising, mm -hmm. integration of, pe of people's uh, local governments with the people. Mm -hmm. um, and then lots of different ideas 
about what can be what can be uh, mm -hmm. what can be taught to people through the land that's sequestered. Mm -hmm. um, lots and lots that's of different, lots and lots of different things. Permaculture and design, fruit forest. Yeah. Not you're not a fan of this one, but drying <laughs> yeah. meat, um, yeah. preserving vegetables, herbal remedies, sewing and knitting. Mm -hmm. Knife sharpening, recycling, making charcoal, trapping the mm -hmm. sun's heat, uh, topography, yep. coppice, uh, coppice Maps, and hazel, yep. conservation, mm -hmm. surveying, surveying the biosphere in its totality mm -hmm. uh, regularly, uh, first aid, um, and then kind of like trying to get that community so that it's kind of working together. Um, mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where I've got to. It's very, very okay. early days. Okay. Uh, well, well, well. Thank you. That's great. It's a lot like the. Have you heard of the transition movement? That was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he was neat. He was great. He came over and visited us in Maine, and uh, you know, his was sort of more of a a worldwide movement. The transition idea. Okay. Yeah. And it was I really think, um, yeah I, I i just think that there are things that we can do now yeah uh to try and mitigate the future you know I, I i don't believe that we just have to we just have to sit on our hands and and let it happen even though people will shoot you down as simon was talking about as they <laughs> as they do but um you know this is in in the eyes of the community this is a nice thing for them you know and uh and it doesn't need to be doom and gloom it can be very very positive um and then see where it goes you know does it die does it does it have legs does it you know can it be expanded can it be copied um in other communities around the country around the world even who knows you know yeah i like it yeah I become involved in different groups, uh, the Odd Fellows and the Grange, and I kind of see them as, okay, they're dying institutions, but maybe like we can take them over and turn them into something, a uh, sort of a seed of a, a place to uh, get people together again. Um, and it seems to me that you know, both the Odd Fellows and the uh, the Grange are both kind of reinventing themselves a little bit lately which is really a hopeful thing. And I don't know, you know, at this stage, it's a little too early to figure out whether it's happening or not, but we're having a good yeah. time. When, when I was, um, when I was, when I was developing my business, I, I used to think about um, like uh, purpose, you know, what, what's my purpose? Well, my purpose is to develop this product that I invented and I'm going to, uh, scale it so that everybody can buy it and it's better it's more sustainable than what's available and you know this is my purpose to do my bit for the environment but in the long run what I what I realized was actually um I wasn't I wasn't yeah it was longer lasting but I was still contributing to this to this wasteful you know um huge manufacturing scale scaling of manufacturing in society and and I I was lying to myself. I couldn't live with that lie. And so I stopped. But what I have come to realize is actually the the, the um, purpose is, is it's in it's in it's in those deep skills in nature that on it. I think that is honestly where people's purpose lies. You know, no one will deny that going to the countryside is a is what they love to do or go to the beach or it's that connection with nature you know that's what i think where the purpose for people people is is and i think and that there's connect, you know there's that yeah, long, back. longitudinal study from the states on happiness and they found that the most important thing is relationships there's there's nothing that correlates better with happiness mm -hmm. or joy fulfillment in life than the quality of your relationships and so everybody wants to be loved 
<laughs> yeah, and and to be of service, you know, uh, you know, when you're you're helping others, uh, and uh, th there's a great joy that comes with that, and then having stable. Uh, relationships like family relationships and things like that or a community um and things like that uh, there's um what do you call it uh, we have a youtube comment and they they're saying the odd fellows time passed they serve their purpose the odd fellows no, part of the orphans something with the orphans but i i, I just wanted to uh, respond to that quickly that uh, a lot of the things that we had in pre-industrial times are now going to be again very important, um, and part of that is that personal relationships, uh, like groups like the Odd Fellows or the Masons or or, or who or the Anabaptists or church group, uh, you know, it it depends, and that's for forming relationships, um, so that you have a network of people if you are down on hard times that you can go to and you can get help, and uh, you can be of service to others when they're on hard times. Yeah, I was going to say about the Odd Fellows. Uh, do you know John Michael Greer? Yeah. Uh, John, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he uh, he just came up with a, a new book about the Odd Fellows, and so he kind of took on the Odd Fellows. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And he's one of the uh, peak oil prophet types that have written an awful lot about what is going to happen and things. And I really like his his analysis of things. I mean, he's uh, you know he gets off in the uh, uh, a little bit in other religious stuff and things, but I, I do think he's in. Entertain one of the uh, most interesting characters, and he actually is into the Odd Fellows. So, I don't know, Odd Fellows. We're just trying to keep together a building that we use for community events. So that's our main thing, you know. So, I don't know about all the rest of it, and you know, honestly, with the Grange, I don't know about all the rest of it also. But we're trying to keep together the the community center, and it things change over many years, and maybe. Uh, Maybe some of the old uh, structures have to be chucked, and I agree they're kind of moribund. But well, well, we're good. we're in our our last nine minutes here, yeah. and uh, so I just wanted to schedule next time, and yeah. also I was wondering if Ivor, if you want to do a, do a presentation sometime on your uh, Swan's Island and the Grange and the other transition plans that you have sure. as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, mine, mine. I'm just sort of like cheerleader for the other people that are doing things and you know i bring uh you know like uh, i helped a friend to do a little um uh, music thing and he's a younger guy and i have to confess that i didn't really like his music that much but it was awfully fun to go and make the whole thing happen yeah all right so did we want to and, and also i i wanted to do an australia new zealand hawaii one because uh, i got another peak oil guy from Hawaii uh, who, who, who wanted to join. Uh, so for the next time for the European time zone, uh, I guess we might have to coordinate with Simon as well. But, uh, how about January 8th? January 8th, which is a... a, a uh, Monday. 10 a.m. also? Yeah, or 9, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how Simon is. And then Dune, when would be a good time for the Australia one? Would you be able to do, say, the 15th? Um, you're going to have, have them that often, are you? Well, oh, maybe maybe we should do the 22nd, two weeks. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. All right, yeah. You want me to give a little presentation on our community? Sure. Mm. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I'd like yeah. to hear more about your community, Dune, definitely. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and those are usually five Eastern Standard Time, right? No. Yeah. So, so they're, they're usually seven Eastern Standard Time? Seven Eastern Standard Time. That's where it was. Seven Eastern Standard Time, yeah. In the winter. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the summer, the Eastern Daylight Savings Time. <laughs> yeah, Australia has two different, two or three different um, time zones, right? One of which is an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's in South Australia. In the middle of the continent, yeah. Yeah, I have a friend who's there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't mind what the time is, really. Um, yeah, I, I can get up in the middle of the night if I have to. Mm -hmm. And and so do you think you'll be able... Do you guys have regular meetings or anything? Our community? For your community? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we, we purposely have. We had our 
a monthly meeting two days ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, have a we have two meetings a month. One we call uh, like a business meeting, and then two weeks later we have a, um, a forum about one particular topic that we're all okay. worried about trying to come to uh, terms with. Jim, without yeah. giving too much away before you talk, are, are you in a, a yurt? Or with a little yeah, is it? Uh, up, up in the roof there there's a little turret with windows and uh oh. to let and and you can open and close them with uh, little electric motors to let the air out if you want to yeah so and is it is it a type of year that you're in it, it's actually uh a standard building materials but um actually uh, just uh, about 50 meters away there is a yurt and there's somebody living in that and, and i lived in that for a while and and it was the yurt that actually gave me the um the, the beauty of, of a kind of a, a a building without any real walls because it's it's not not sort of like four walls uh, with a barrier you're, you're kind of connected to to the outside by by not having walls yeah so I have a request uh, that uh, you try to inject like a spiritual poem or little parable in there and maybe see if that helps the meeting flow better or your relationships go better. And I did, did, with the chat GPT, I know I sent you some drafts, um, but anyways, if, if something that, that works for you, because I know you were having those issues with the relationships and having yeah. that little tiny spiritual component, I think can make a big difference. Well, our, 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 it was originally designed around permaculture as our spiritual component, but, but people were not uh, fully into permaculture. You need to get pe people who are already into permaculture. Otherwise, they, they go about their suburban life, um, <laughs> even though they're mm -hmm. living in a community. Yeah. But yeah, if I mean, it doesn't ha like, uh, well, we can talk about it more on Messenger, uh, but yeah. maybe I can help you craft something, some kind of statement, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, intro something. statement to, to help align. I it. used chat, chat D, D, T to get a code of ethics, and uh, that worked out really well. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Been good. Good to the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, well, we're looking forward to hearing your progress in, uh, in your presentation. Okay. Any 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 final remarks, guys, before we uh, round up for the day? No, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm amazed at what Simon's trying to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, okay. And oh, we've got a bunch of people. Uh, permaculture for sure is amazing. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, and uh, in terms of our YouTube listeners, I hope you uh, stay on the lookout for the next one uh, that's coming around and then you join in and then um, you, you can ask your questions then and you can also join our Facebook, um, which should be in the uh, links below as well as Simon Michaud's presentation. All right. And uh, so we leave you as we found you and the love and in the light of the one infinite creator. And go forth, therefore, rejoicing in the power and in the peace of the one infinite creator. Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone.